pretty much what they've been using ever since. Now, soybean oil has a problem. It causes you to become hyperglycemic and diabetic. <laughs> What's the biggest change that's happened in the Western diet in the United States, let's talk about, because that's where, you know, I'm most familiar with the data. And he has looked at patients with severe COVID in the hospital and they have super high rates of uh saying I got superpowers, superpowers, I got superpowers, superpowers, I got superpowers, superpowers, working seven days a week and twenty-four hours. Yep, I got the business saying this. Jack and Goodrich, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become a Superhero Take Two. Layman, thank you for having me back. It's really an honor. Well, you, you've got the, uh, the privilege. I believe you are the highest viewed YouTube and listened podcast out of 175 released recordings, give or take. Well, that's that's definitely an honor. I don't know what that says about people's spare time, <laughs> but uh, I think it's a it's definitely a message that people are interested in hearing. Well, for people that have just tuned in or that just dialed in first time, the reason I would love for you to stick around today, Tucker is a powerhouse of knowledge. But specifically, we're going to focus on the the, the seed oil or vegetable oil paradox and why maybe we should be cutting these out of our diet is a basic simple oversimplified version is there anything else that you want to tack in there as well Tucker no that'll well it's you know I think it's the I think it's the answer to the question why have we all gotten fat and sick yeah great question first question if you had 60 seconds to live right you're in a lift the cable's been cut and you're at the top of the Burj Khalifa and in Saudi Arabia and Dubai or whatever it's got 60 seconds before it hits you're in the lift with someone else and you've got to explain to them what not to eat <laughs> what well, would you say <laughs> honestly I think at that point I would say let's pray we don't have time to do much else <laughs> it's definitely not the time to be fixing your diet but that's actually a great point because uh as we're coming out of the COVID years, um, they finally got around to doing a study where they took people who were critically ill in the hospital with COVID and they started supplementing them with omega-3 fats. And the idea was to replace the omega-6 fats. And they did see benefits, but you know, when you're in the hospital with serious disease, that's too late, right? That's not the time to do it. The time to do it is when you're healthy and you know at the peak of your powers and your body's healing capacity is as high as it's going to be not when you are totally sick and broken right for covid particularly there is a clear pathway between seed oil consumption and bad outcomes right but again you know you need time to replace the fats in your body through a dietary change and that time is years likely at least months not hours or days so yeah if you're <laughs> if i'm falling in a uh in a if i'm taking a long elevator ride down uh towards the afterlife that's not the topic i'm going to be bringing up <laughs> Let's, let's hypothesize but, that they, they're going to use your body as a cushion to save their own. <laughs> yeah, but the, ele but the elevator pitch is we've all gotten fat, most notably, and sick, diabetes, heart disease, cancer rates have all gone up all around the world, but not just in humans, in animal species. And the common denominator, as far as I've been able to tell through my research, has been an increased consumption of seed oils, which are uh, in the levels we are currently eating them outside the scope of what we are prepared for by evolution. And these are fats that turn into toxins in the cooking process and once they are in our body. And they are, you know, with clearly in the scientific and medical literature implicated in all of these diseases that were all of the chronic diseases that are reflecting the entire planet. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great point. Before we get stuck into this, the, the first interview that you and I did, I will link here because that has all of Tucker's backstory. I don't, we don't need to go into that today. He is incredibly credible. I can assure you of that having gone through it. 
I want you to watch that and then we'll listen to that and then come back to this as well. It'll tie in beautifully. What are seed oils uh, for, the, for the uninitiated and maybe rank them, if you can, not from worst to best in the process? Well, seed oils are the fats that are extracted from seeds, right? Like corn oil is a seed oil. Corn comes from the corn oil comes from the corn seed. Soybean, uh, rice bran oil, cotton seed oil, um, sesame seed oil. You know, there's a whole variety. When you hear the name, you know it's it's a seed oil. Olive oil is made primarily from the fruit of the olive, um, so it tends to have uh less of the harmful fats and we'll get to what those are in a moment um a coconut because it's a tropical seed has a very different fatty acid profile and so it tends to be beneficial so the problem is and how you rank what's a better oil versus a worse oil is how much of a specific type of fat there is in the in the oil and that's omega-6 fats omega-6 is a the term is a description of a specific type of fat. We won't get into the chemistry behind that. Um, but they have a, they are what are known as polyunsaturated fats. And polyunsaturated fats, whether they're omega-6 or omega-3 fats, tend to be much more susceptible to oxidation. Oxidation means they go rancid quickly, right? And that's why when you have a fish that's been sitting in your fridge for too long, it stinks. It's because of rancid omega rancid polyunsaturated fats, in that case, omega-3 fats. We're told not to eat rancid foods because rancid fats are toxic. And the most toxic rancid fats are the omega-6 fats. And in the process of making seed oils, these fats go rancid. Um, and by the time you pick them up at the supermarket, they are 400 to 1,000 times as rancid as the fats in your tissues, right? So even before you open the bottle, just because of the processing that it goes through, these fats have become rancid. So you are consuming product that has some quantity of toxic aldehydes and other chemicals in it, right? And that is what leads to the negative health effects. So essentially you want um, fats that have very little omega-6 fats. You want Obviously, with any fats, you want fresh fats, fresh foods, not stuff that's been sitting around uh, preserved on a shelf for a long period of time. And you especially don't want to eat things that quickly go rancid when they're sitting around on a shelf like a seed oil does. Okay, so if you were to, I'll come back to that question, because I saw a guy on TikTok who was, he's a fitness guy. And I forget his name. He's been debunking a number of videos and he was um, debunking Paul Saladino's video talking about seed oils. And he was saying like, um, you know, the hexane, the stuff that they process, you know, is designed in such a way that, that it separates from the seed oil and it's actually not as bad as people make out. <clears throat> Have you seen rebuttals like this? And what are your thoughts? Well, hex hexane is a solvent, right? Alcohol is a solvent. Um, there, I can't remember the other common one right now that everybody uses for cleaning furniture or whatever. What, sodium um, bicarbonate, maybe? Or? No, no, no. It's, uh, I, I can't remember. It'll come back to me. But anyway, hexane is a solvent, right? Hexane is what they use to remove the fats from the seed, right? So they grind up the seed. They typically press it. They're left with uh, oil on the one side and then some, you know, the protein and the fiber and whatever else is in the seed in the other side. And then they douse that in hexane, which causes the fat to go into solution in the hexane. And then they can evaporate the hexane off, leaving the fat and the protein separate, right? So soybean protein that is in lots of foods is the byproduct of soybean oil production, right? And that follows correct. As far as I know, hexane the whole reason they use it is because it's very volatile and it evaporates off very quickly. And as far as I know, there's no hexane left in these oils when you consume them, right? But that's the wrong question to ask, right? The, quest the right question to ask is, are there any problematic things that are in the oils because of their nature, right? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. And 
folks who understand this process a little bit better, they recognize that there are highly toxic, mutagenic, DNA damaging chemicals that omega-6 fats turn into both in the bottle while you are cooking them and in your body after you consume them. And that's what's the problem. Hexane is not an issue. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. It's so it was so interesting just watching. I mean, that said, hexane's like highly toxic. <laughs> and if you consumed any hexane, it would be an extremely bad thing. But as far as I've ever seen, it does not get into the finished product that we we're sold. Well, it's it's what what I think is so interesting is like th these people that can say absolutes about the stuff. It's like, hey, thalidomide is perfectly safe, right? And we know how that worked out. The medication that I was on for 17 years, Omeprazole, Somac, you know, the proton pump inhibitors was safe right. for 30 years. And now they know it's not. And so it's like, how can you be so certain about any of this stuff? Well, you can't, right? How natural is it to extract the fat from the seed? Could that ever have been replicated before modern machinery? Yeah, you know, I looked up, um, I was, you know, a lot of folks talk about how processed foods are bad. And there's a definition of processed foods that's been used in a bunch of studies called NOVA, N-O-V-A, um, which doesn't actually stand for anything. Um, so according to the NOVA protocol, the NOVA idea of what's a processed food, seed oils are not a processed food. Now, I would argue that there's a really simple way, basically all human foods are processed to some degree, right? One of my favorite papers was done by Dan Lieberman looking at meat processing, and they were referring to slicing up meat with rocks, right? Cavemen, right? Cavemen processed meat by cutting it up with sharp rocks, and that made it more digestible and therefore more nutritious to them, right? So we've basically evolved to depend on processed food, right? You can't a human, a modern human can't really get by on a raw food diet. We are no longer able to extract enough nutrients to survive on that food, right? So saying processed foods are bad is kind of like, yeah, not really. Everything's, it, like you just said, it always depends. Um, so one of the rules of thumbs that I came up with for what's a good processed food versus a bad processed food is if you can do the processing in your kitchen, yourself, then it's probably a reasonably healthy processed food. And it's the type of thing your grandmother or your great grandmother may have been able to make, right? So butter, you can make butter at home. When I was a little kid, we went to a museum and we were shown how to make butter. It's fairly simple, right? You do it with a little butter churn, even a little kid can do it. Um, coconut oil, you can make coconut oil or beef tallow or whatever else you want to in your kitchen. So then I found a recipe for soybean oil, right? How to make soybean oil in your kitchen. And the first thing you need is a press, right? Which nobody has in their kitchen to squeeze most of the oil out. And then you need hexane, okay? Which uh, a, one of the scientists who follows me on Twitter told me is illegal to have shipped to a home address because of how toxic it is. Right. And then you need an evaporator to get the hexane back out of the oil, right? Which is something that you would find in an industrial plant or a laboratory, but not in anybody's kitchen, ignoring the fact that the hexane is toxic, right? And highly volatile. So you would have to wear some kind of a military grade gas mask while you're making this healthy ingredient, you know, of soybean oil. Um, so that's kind of. I think a good rule of thumb for is something so processed, you know, is it too processed is a good way to think of it, right? And most of these seed oils are require so much processing that you just, you can't do it at home. You need an industrial plant to do it at any scale. Now, there are some exceptions to that, right? Soybean oil, or not soybean oil, sesame seed oil is one of the oldest seed oils. It is thought to have been in the human diet for about 5,000 years. Um, and, you know, if you're doing it seasonally, right, when you have a sesame seed crop, then it's probably much better, much less likely to be harmful for you than if you are consuming soybean oil year round that's been stored and is going rancid as it's been stored. Um, the Indians, uh, you know, 
the subcontinental Asian Indians um, were the ones who started consuming sesame seed oil thousands of years. The Indians are also the first people, the people who are given the credit of discovering diabetes, right? So even if we go back 2,500 years, there's this correlation between seed oil consumption and um, diabetes and chronic diseases, right? So they were essentially processing sesame seed oil to make seed oils as a replacement for the uh, animal fats that are fairly difficult to come by even today in India. And, you know, that appears to be the start of the processed food problem. But I don't think it's per se a processed food problem, right? Because butter doesn't seem to be a problem. There are lots of other processed foods that don't really seem to be a problem. It seems to be the foods with the bad ingredients and the ingredients that turn into toxins in your body. Well, we haven't even explored the uh, the impact that using genetically modified glyphosate doused soybeans making soybean oil are going to have like is that another layer of danger and complexity that that plays another factor yeah glyphosate i actually spoke to stephanie senef who's one of the um leading advocates of that point of view and a lot of that's still speculative that said don't eat glyphosate. <laughs> and I think avoiding anything that might have it in it is probably a wise idea. Um, I think if we've learned anything, and the same goes for a lot of GMO crops, they're not automatically harmful. It really depends on what's done. But I mean, I think after the last three years of the entire planet getting sick from a genetically modified organism, that anybody who poo poos concerns about GMOs is full of baloney and unfortunately there are way too many people who poo poo the concerns about that but again i think it's you know there's a big difference between a genetically modified salmon that's modified to grow more quickly and may get loose into the environment and cause unknowable problems in our ecology and something like a yellow rice where they add in a gene that allows rice to make beta carotene right which is the precursor for vitamin a when you're getting it from you know a carrot and that has the benefit that is a beneficial genetically modified organism i think that can help cure you know malnutrition related blindness around the world i think that's a beneficial crop i think you know personally i'm super gluten sensitive um we know exactly why gluten is toxic and it's not because it's a genetically modified organism it's because it was crossed 10,000 years ago with a toxic weed called goat grass right now if we could go in and alter wheat so that that toxic amino acid that is what causes celiac disease was no longer part of wheat i think that would be a very beneficial thing and i would probably be able to eat croissants again and which would be nice <laughs> Right. So I think with something like a GMO, you've really got to examine exactly what is happening in the process. Right. Are you trying to make a virus more pathogenic? That's a bad idea. Are you adding <laughs> beta carotene into a into rice, which is probably not going to have any effect in the environment? Or, for instance, some of these GMO uh, low linoleic acid oil crops like soybean, that's going to make the crop a better crop. Right. And all they're doing is knocking out the seeds ability to to create the omega six fats that are the problematic part of the of the oil. So, yeah. Or or we could just be honest with the data and realize that animal based nutrition is by far and away the most <laughs> like less labor intensive, less heartache, tastiest, best way of going about things. And even in India, this chap that I spoke to you about at BNS has become a good friend has been responsible for bringing the carnivore diet. It's not even called right. that though, to this Indian community where I was under the impression that they were 90% vegetarian because of cultural reasons. And it turns out that's not the case at all. It's to do with the lack of financial resources to buy meat. And he said that the poorer people, he comes from a very wealthy family, mind you, and he eats mutton. He doesn't eat beef because anything that looks like a cow is sacred. Right. So he eats, he eats mutton like it's going out of fashion, lost a heap of weight, He's like an Indian Paul Saladino, right? <laughs> it's great. Right. And, uh, but he's been able to get vegetarians to go almost carnival by 
eating mainly eggs. And um, because, and we were talking offline about the, the correlation with India and where all this type two diabetes and this chronic disease has come from, from a country that's been eating quite high carbohydrate for a long time. Are you able to explore and explain a little bit more about that? You know, as, as I said, the history of diabetes in India goes back a long time. However, they are now in the middle of an explosion of type two diabetes. It's not because their carbohydrate consumption is going up. I mean, I read, I think it was the pure epidemi epidemiological survey of diet around the world looked at India and the leading source of saturated fat in the Indian diet is from tea. Okay. Tea, because you put milk in your tea, that tells you how little fat they eat in their wow. diet, right? It's overwhelmingly a carbohydrate based diet. And there are cultural components to that. I shared an office with a uh, Jane for two and a half years who were one of the most vegetarian and oldest vegetarian populations in the world. Um, and, you know, there is definitely a cultural and religious component to it, but a lot of it's also just they're poor and they can't afford even the dairy fats that they are allowed on that, you know, a Jane is allowed uh, to consume, right? The poverty over there is hard to fathom when you live in the West. Um, but you know, we don't have any evidence that carbohydrates per se cause type two diabetes, right? If you, there's a population in the South Pacific called the Tucacenta, they eat a 94% carbohydrate diet, mostly through sweet potatoes or yams, I guess, which are similar to what some of us call sweet yeah. potatoes. And they, the rest of what they get is pork and vegetables and they have zero diabetes. They are all lean. They have low rates of heart disease. They're all healthy, right? So carbohydrate is not doing it on its own. But when you start adding in seed oils and no, the omega-6 fats, that combination is what triggers diabetes. And how do we know this? So back in the 1960s, they had a medical problem where some people were not able to eat orally, right? Um, they could only be fed intravenously. And the first thing they tried to do was feed them car a carbohydrate compound to give them enough nutrition so that they could survive until, you know, they healed from the surgery or, you know, whatever was wrong with them got well enough so that they could start eating again. Um, and then they came up with the idea of using seed oils, right? Because they contain omega-6 fats, which are, were at the time considered essential and essential in nutrition means something that your body has to have for survival that it can't make itself right so water for instance would be essential you have to have water but you can't make water in your body um, or oxygen to you know to go with two extreme examples so there are certain fats that your body has to have that it can't make itself right and these are the polyunsaturated fats um, so thinking that the omega-6 fat and seed oils, linoleic acid, was essential. They said, okay, well, let's start feeding them. First, they used cottonseed oil. Well, that didn't turn out all that well. Then they switched over to soybean oil, right? And that's pretty much what they've been using ever since. Now, soybean oil has a problem. It causes you to become hyperglycemic and diabetic, <laughs> which they figured out in 1964. And ever since then, whenever you want to make healthy adults insulin resistant, in short order, they give you intravenous soybean oil. Bingo, right? What's the biggest change that's happened in the Western diet in the United States? Let's talk about, because that's where, you know, I'm most familiar with the data. What's the biggest change in the diet over the last 120 years? The increase in soybean oil and the replacement of animal fats with uh, these seed oils, right? So should we be surprised that if you're in a lab experiment, they give you soybean oil to cause type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, that we're seeing the same thing in a population that's eating massive, unprecedented quantities of soybean oil, right? In countries like India or Japan or China, who traditionally had a very high carbohydrate diet, what we've seen as they go through what's called a nutritional transition, which is from their traditional diet to a more modern, quote unquote, industrial diet, 
the first thing that happens is their carbohydrate consumption goes down, right? And their fat consumption goes up. In the modern era, it, that means that their consumption of vegetable oils goes up because that's the cheapest fat. And if you're a poor person in India, you're not going to be able to afford butter or whatever your fat substitute is based on your religious constraints, right? You're going to be consuming lots more seed oils. And that's exactly what's happened as their... Um, as diabetes has exploded in those countries. Yeah, the, the cruel irony is that they can't afford not to. Well, the rest of the world can't afford not to because right. um, when we last spoke, I'd interviewed Dr. James Mukey, who's a, an ophthalmologist out of Australia, who is like a, a modern day Fred Hollows, if you remember Fred Hollows, the guy that bought sight back to millions of people in Southeast Asia. And, right. and he's a, an anti-sugar guy. Uh, and a low carb guy. And he was talking about Australia was on track to spend 100% of its GDP on type 2 diabetes alone by 2038. Right? Same with North America, Canada, I think the UK were on track as well. So yeah. there's, we, there has to be something done about it. Um, I want to talk about something that I believe we spoke about, we might have spoken about it offline last conversation. So I want to bring it up again. It was with regards to the response to COVID, which we now know for better or worse, was created, engineered, gain of function, whatever you want to call it. People, the thing that did the damage to people from COVID long before the vaccines came around was the cytokine storm triggered by excessively stored linoleic acid. Am I getting right. that right? That's Can you correct. expand on that a little bit for me? Okay. So back to another human experiment. Um, when you're in an intensive care unit, you may not, you know, you it's say you're comatose, right? You can't eat, obviously, um, but they want to keep you alive. And they do this typically with intravenous food, which gets us back to this soybean oil product, intralipid, right? So they did an experiment where, unfortunately, people, these people often come down with a condition known as ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, right? ARDS is a essentially partly a cytokine storm, but it is a process where you have an immune reaction and your body overreacts and it kills you, okay? So in this experiment, and that was a common problem with ICU patients who were put on intravenous uh, nutrition, parenteral nutrition, it's known as, right? It goes around the digestive tract. Um, so they started tracking it and they figured out that it was the intralipid right and this was poor science but it was very good medicine over the course of as i recall this five-year survey they stopped using intralipid infusion as a source of parenteral nutrition and their mortality rate went down sevenfold right the rate of ARDS that they were having went down sevenfold now in the course of doing that they figured out Essentially, what is what ha what causes ARDS, right? Is you need some sort of immune trigger, which is often an infection like COVID. Although it can happen with the flu, it can happen after you've had a burn, a severe burn, right? Because the burn stimulates, you know, your immune reaction is a, is a response to an injury. The injury could be an infection, it could be a burn, right, which damages tissue, and the same process gets cooked kicked off in your body to repair the damage. So this was originally discovered in burn patients in Japan. And what they discovered was that linoleic acid is converted by your white blood cells into something called leukotoxin, right? Leukotoxin is then converted by a um, soluble epoxy hydrolase, SEH, into what's known as leukotoxin diol. Leukotoxin diol is what causes ARDS, right? So two steps from the seed oils you are consuming, right? So the reason that these ICU patients are having this increased sevenfold higher rate of mortality from ARDS is because we're pumping them full of the precursor to ARDS, the, essentially the ammunition that your white blood cells are using to fight off an infection, which in a normal amount would be a beneficial process, right? Because this leukotoxin is, you know, toxic, highly toxic. If you inject it into dogs, as they did in one experiment, they die of ARDS in about 45 minutes, right? 
very highly toxic. But if you have too much of it in your body and you get some sort of injury, then your body overproduces it. And I don't think it's strictly considered to be a cytokine, but it's part of the same process, right? A cytokine storm is when your own immune system is converting things in your body into defenses against whatever it is that's bothering your body, right? Usually a pathogen. Um, and this process of converting linoleic acid into leukotoxin diol is a primary part of that defensive process. So let's fast forward to COVID. We see a tenfold increase in mortality in countries with high rates of obesity. Now, I think, and I think the evidence supports this statement that obesity is caused by excess consumption of seed oils. It also changes the fatty acid balance in your body and means you are stuffed full of linoleic acid. Well, then along comes this lung pathogen, COVID, right, that kicks off a autoimmune response, you know, SARS-1 or SARS-2 both did the same thing, right? I found one paper where they basically said, you know, ARDS is how SARS kills you. And it does so by converting linoleic acid into leukotoxin diol. And there's a researcher, Bruce Hammack, who was the fellow who uh, mm -hmm. discovered the last step of this process, the soluble epoxy, epoxide hydrolase, SEH. Um, and he has looked at patients with severe COVID in the hospital, and they have super high rates of uh, leukotoxin in their blood. And that's why they're having this, that's why they're having ARDS, right? Because of this toxin that's made from seed oils. So they tried to do, as I was saying in your elevator analogy, they tried to head this off by, if you um, have higher rates of omega-3 fats in your diet and in your body tissues, then that goes through a different pathway and doesn't produce this toxin. And it turns out that if you do that with people who have severe COVID, it is somewhat protective against severe COVID when you're hospitalized with it. But as I said, that's, you know, it's too late to be doing it at that point. So basic advice for anyone, because we're getting pretty technical. Uh, yeah. And, and even someone who's been immersed in this for a few years, it's, it's uh, I, I understand where it's coming from. But in layman's terms, right? In layman's terms, whatever you want to call it, the best thing that you can do to, to preserve your health and improve your health would be to reduce the amount of linoleic or omega-6 in your diet fundamentally. Yeah. Right? First step. First step is reduce the thing that shouldn't be there. Okay, Second step it, is, sorry. as you were discussing with the Indians, go back to what a traditional diet looked like, which even in a country like India would have included a lot of dairy fat and, you know, which is an animal fat, of course. There is evidence, Harvard University, for instance, has patented a dairy fat, a trans fat found in dairy because of the beneficial effects in type two diabetes, right? So let's go back to eating these things, eating these things that are beneficial. And in some cases, it appears to be protective against the effects of consuming too much seed oils, right? But that's got to be the second step because what we do also know is that you can't, oh, you can't, if you're eating too much of these seed oils, you can't eat enough of the beneficial fats like omega 3 or like dairy fat to compensate for the effects, right? Yeah. And we spoke about this on the last chat we had. My ability to be in the sun has infinitely improved it's gotten even better and living in the caribbean i barely wear a shirt um which we can is what see. i've become i've become famous for right, right. <laughs> because it's just like it's, it's so beautiful here so i'm out in the sun as much as i can and i never ever get badly burnt and i say and i say badly because there's been a couple of times i fell asleep for five hours in the midday sun and i'm a little bit red at the end of the day and then the next day i'm i'm brown as and i've got Scottish and English roots, right? So I've got no, no African right. in me is that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, and I've, I've seen the same thing. I mean, I used to go, you know, we're both a similar background. I'm English and Irish and German, blonde hair or blue eyes. And I used to roast in 45 minutes. I would get a severe sunburn in 45 minutes in the sun. And nowadays I live in here in Idaho in the high desert and I go out, you know, I did a, three-day 
backpacking trip this summer up in the mountains. And like you said, I got a little pink after 12 hours in the sun at the end of the first day and was brown after that. No serious sunburn, no peeling. You know, it's just, it's been night and day. And why does that happen? Well, we happen to know, right? We, the linoleic acid in your tissue breaks down into these toxins and that is what causes the tissue damage, right? And if you lower that, right? And they've done this in animal models with hairless mice, poor creatures. And they've, you know, it's like a rheostat. The more polyunsaturated, omega-6 polyunsaturated fats they put into them, the more susceptible they are to sunburn and then skin cancer. And omega-3 fats, the, you know, polyunsaturated fats that you find in animal fats and fish and fish are protective against this process because they don't produce the same toxins when they're exposed to UV light or oxidative damage. For more information on this fascinating subject, check out Dr. Stephanie Seneff's book. Uh, and she, that she, hers was one of the only videos that's been deleted off YouTube, by the way, Tucker. Um, really? Yeah, that it said for medical misinformation, but it's like um, well, we know what that means. <laughs> it means too often right. now. It means uh oh, <laughs> they're getting too close. <laughs> so, um, but she she's a glyphosate and Roundup or um, autism and Roundup expert, right? She's got four four degrees from MIT and a PhD. It's part of that. So check her out. That's fascinating stuff because she talks about how you can get it out of your system through, I think being in the sun helps with that as well. Once you remove it from your diet, I think being in the sun helps synthesize it out of your system. If you're in a, if on a low carb diet as well. I don't know about that. I mean, the problem with glyphosate as a universal explanation is that all of this stuff started long before glyphosate was introduced into the food system. Oh, the C, the omega six I'm talking about. The right, right, right. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. You know, how to get over it. That's an interesting question. Um, in my experience, my susceptibility to sunburn decreased in weeks. Um, and, you know, different tissues in your body have different turnovers, right? Skin is one of the highest, obviously, because it's on the outside and it's exposed to constant damage. So, you know, that's why you heal fairly quickly. You know, you're um, so that tissue is turned over. And if you cut omega-6 out of your diet, it's going to go down in those tissues a lot faster. For other tissues that have much lower turnovers, like fat tissue, for instance, it can take four or five years to get back down to an evolutionary level of omega-6 fat in your stored adipose tissue. Um, and then there's cartilage where the half-life so the half-life of the half-life of fat tissue is about two years meaning that you know all of your fat cells about two half of them will turn over every two years for cartilage the turnover is 50 to 100 years right so while cartilage takes up omega-6 fats very quickly we don't know how long it would take to get that back out of there and that's we think that that's why we are seeing this epidemic of connective tissue disease like ACL tears and arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, right, are all pretty clearly linked to toxic uh, toxins produced by omega-6 fats in the body. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Michaela Peterson. And there's a, another friend of mine, Emily Penton, who's... Um, Friends with Michaela, she's she put multiple sclerosis and rapid onset bipolar disorder into full remission for more than three years, and she's on a raw um, lion diet. She had raw beef and raw beef fat is what basically all she can eat. Um, she doesn't see that as healthy, by the way, but she's healing. She's forty four. She's the most extraordinary person, and uh, she tried to introduce some uh, a salad recently, and it threw her off depressive episode for like three days so she's still got some healing to do um, right but she's she's she lost a heap of weight and you would argue that the more body fat you can lose which you can achieve very easily on a low carb diet would help chelate a lot of any of the stored linoleic acid that might be in excess fat cells um, right yes as a because hypothesis. if you reduce your consumption of carbohydrates 
you are going to force your body to burn fat, right? And yeah. it's one of the fats that's prioritized for oxidation are the omega-6 fats. And the thought is that it's prioritized because it's so unstable, right? Just like if you drink alcohol, oxidation of alcohol is upregulated and that's because it is a toxin and is harmful to the body and the body wants to get rid of it as quickly as it can. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I'm still sober, by the way, Tucker. It's been it's over six years now. It'll be seven years in August. Um, God bless you. Without even a, yeah, we're not even close to a drop. Um, do you know anything about dry fasting? Dry fasting is fasting without water. Yeah. Nil by mouth. I don't. Um, I'm not a personally huge fan of fasting, although it definitely can be therapeutic, but you know, <laughs> I'll explain. Tim, I'll explain. Tim, I'll explain Tim Noakes wrote this book called Waterlogged, which was, you know, he's the fellow who discovered um, that if you overconsume water, it can cause water toxicity. And, you know, the advice that a lot of us were given to hydrate, 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 especially in athletic events, led to a number of people of dying of water toxicity. And Tim Noakes was the guy who figured out what was going on. And he has some uh, historical accounts of people who had been going, you know, stuck in the desert for a week and the level of dehydration that the body can go through and recover and be totally fine is absolutely mind boggling. <laughs> well, well, but we, it also we... sounds super unpleasant. So I suppose <laughs> you'd have to be pretty sick to want to do a dry fast. Well, let, let me share with you my experience because I've, I, and we had Tim Noakes on the show. If I can, I'll make sure that this link uh, goes in, the, in this show notes as well because that's a fascinating conversation. Hypernutremia is the condition, by the way. People. That's right. Thank you. Um, I've done a 48 hour hard dry fast, which is no water contact at all. And the reason that I was doing it is for longevity first. It's not a weight loss thing, although weight loss is a beautiful byproduct. And I've been reading a book by Sergei Filinov, which has been translated from Russian um, into English. It's available on Amazon. It's called like, it's like 10 tips on dry fasting, but just Sergei Filinov with an F. And the, the science around it is really interesting because when you remove the water component from a, like a water fast, that's, that's like one day of dry fasting equates to three days of a wet fast, right? Well, they call it water dieting. And when you remove the water, that's when you start obviously breaking down your own body fat and the water that's in that is structured water. So it's the most pure, like natural source of water on the planet, but it also starves um, and kills off a lot of excess parasites. And it also destroys unnecessary and excess fat cells. So it's really efficient at helping reset people's weight. Um, kills a lot of scar tissue as well, which is why my wife was doing it because she had scarring from these ectopics and these, you know, illegal abortion when she was 15 and 16. So, because it's the survival of the fittest. And so, but she just did a 95 hour dry fast. Can you believe, right? Like we're just building up wow. to this. And then, and then we're off to go do this, you know, what will hopefully be a 10 to 12 day supervised because they anything over five days, they want you to be supervised. Yes. But I tell you, Tucker, like I've done a four day water fast prior, two days of, of dry fasting, which is equivalent to six days water fast was easier. I had less energy than when I was water fasting. You can't be doing anything physical or doing an intensive job. You just got to take it easy and be in nature and stuff if you can. But it was easier and I suffered less cravings for food and water during the process. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've done it by accident on camping trips. <laughs> it's, what, forgetting I know food? Initially, <laughs> the, initially, the water cravings are pretty unpleasant, but I guess you get to a point where it's, uh, it becomes easier. Well, you, you do, and, and you, you don't know whether you're dealing with carbohydrate withdrawal or caffeine withdrawal. Like there's a number of things. If you're a cigarette right. smoker, there could be a number of things there, right? You need to be grounded. Um, you need to spend time in the water as well. We're next to the Caribbean Ocean here, which is really beautiful. Um, and it's a very spiritual thing. And it, 
the people that have been doing regular extended like five day dry fast, they do about one a year is, is a good amount, they reckon, are adding 25 years of great life. And there was a Japanese quote, which I hope you can remember, which talks about like living well until you die. Do you remember what that is? Pin Pin Karori. That's the one. Yeah. What does that mean? It means, uh, oh, what is it? Live, live long, die quickly. Basically, it means it's <laughs> extending your health span. Perfect. It's, the, it's one of my taglines on my Twitter bio. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So there's just something, something I'll send you a link afterwards um, with regards to, it's a fascinating, fascinating book. Cause I think for me, it seems like a, a really fast way of dealing with um, food poisoning, which I've had um, a couple of times in the last four years. And I dry fasted within 18 hours. It was completely gone. Right. Like unbelievably quick turnaround. And whenever you do something and eat something that's no good and you have a really upset thing, you just dry fast, stay in bed, and, and it goes 10 times faster than any other thing. Um, I want to talk about this Vice interview that you did, what, like a year and a half ago now? A Has year it ago? been that long? No, it, yeah. was 20, it was 20, March 22, last year, about a year right. ago. Yep. Um, with Audrey Carl, Carlton, I think is how you pronounce your name. Right. Um, I'll put the link to that. Uh, video that you shared and the link to the Vice article. She it came out in March 2022. She left the next month. By the way, oh, she did. Yeah. Well, I don't know whether she was sacked or whether she moved on, but she left Vice okay. the, the next month. Um. Well, and the, and the context behind that for the interviewers is she had reached out to fellow who goes by the handle seed oil disrespecter on Twitter, uh, Brian Curley, he's a physician and is my co-host in the podcast that I do. And he- Which is called, which, which is called what? They're on YouTube. It's uh, Tucker Goodrich debugging life, um, which is a callback to my career as a uh, computer science engineer. Um, so she reached out to me and we had a long talk on the phone and I went over all of the scientific, you know, rationale for thinking that seed oils are a problem. And then she turned around and wrote this article for Vice where she said there's no scientific evidence to justify thinking they're a problem and basically quoted a bunch of people who said that, right, who had varying degrees of credentials and didn't present any of the other side of the argument. So... I had insisted, which is always a good practice when you're talking to a journalist, that I record the thing. So I released the recording so that everybody could know that, yeah, in fact, they did know that there is another side to this story and they had access to all of it and chose not to tell people the truth about this situation. So, and I don't know, you know, she was very nice and polite with me and I don't know how much of that was the editor versus her. Um, who knows, you know, but in my interactions with her, she was perfectly nice. You, you were perfectly kind to her and you weren't disparaging in any capacity, but I watched her body language when she was interviewing you and she was almost completely disinterested and not really being an active listener at all. And right. A lot of just, people made that same observation. Yeah. And I think it's like, if someone really cares about something, like they'll pay attention to it. Right. And I, I don't want to hate on her, but she's part of the mainstream narrative, which has been causing so many of the, the challenges around trying to get the dialogue, I'm not even trying to say that we're hundred percent correct. I spoke about this last time we, we met. It's like, I don't purport to know all of this hundred percent. I don't, but right. I'm open to learning more and I'll put my hand up when I'm wrong, but you've got to be able to put more information out that's from both sides to be able to make a more informed decision, right? Well, and you've got to be, I mean, yeah, you've got to be, it's definitely an issue, right? The diet space, diet and health space, there's a lot of, there's a big spectrum of information and it goes from solid quote unquote consensus science through what's probably actual science and then to stuff at the other end that's just probably you know i mean 
I don't know, everybody likes to hate on crystals. So I'll, I will say that crystal healing is probably totally BS, although maybe someday we'll find out it's not, right? And it's often hard to figure out where the line is, right? And part of the way that if you're somebody like her, you need to figure out where the line is, is what's the credibility of the people saying this, right? And now I don't have a scientific degree. I'm not a medical doctor. One of the reasons I started up the podcast, additional, you know, in subsequently to uh, releasing that interview was to go interview some of the actual scientists like Bruce Hammock, I mentioned earlier, who are doing the research on this and who can tell you, you know, I just had a fellow Tom Brenna on. He was, he's a PhD researcher at the Dell School of Medicine and Pediatrics. And he was on the Dietary Guideline Committee. And he will give you chapter and verse on why excess omega-6 fat in the diet is a problem and why you need more healthy fats like omega-3. And he actually got the World Health Organization to change their feeding guidelines because of the research that he's done. So, you know, there's credible research behind this. It's not just woo is the term people like to use. You know, it's not just crystal healing, right? There is solid science. We know that giving people intralipid causes disease, right? And we know the mechanism by which that happens. We know that intralipid causes insulin resistance, right? It's been the standard approach used experimentally since 1964. <laughs> and, you know, you can go out and read all the papers yourself, which I always recommend to people to do, you know, don't take my word for it. Educate yourself, make sure that this is actual. And to your point, she seemed to be, Audrey seemed to be, she had an agenda, right? She knew the article she wrote before she talked to anybody. And when I started giving her information that didn't go along with that narrative, she lost interest. Yeah, She was pol polite enough to let me blabber on. And unfortunately for her to make it perfectly clear that there was a scientific basis for what she was poo-pooing. But, you know, say la vie. Say la vie. I had a conversation with my darling wife the other day. I said, Anna, if I ever get involved in a car accident and I'm unconscious and in a coma, I want you to stop the hospital feeding me like uh, the glucose IV or whatever. I want you to make a bone broth. <laughs> put that, well, I don't know. Me, intravenously. Honestly, a glucose <laughs> IV was one of the best things that they can give you. What you wouldn't want would be the soybean oil IV. Um, what about a bone broth IV? I don't know that that's ever been tested. I mean, <laughs> you got to you got to remember there's a lot of processing that goes on in the gut and not everything, you know, not everything that goes into your mouth is suitable to be injected directly into your veins. So I would not try not bone broth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would not try bone, bone broth without experimenting on some Poor animal if you could, first. If if it could go in your stomach first, like in a feeding tube, like a feeding tube, I'm talking about, right? Yeah, a feeding you, tube. A feeding tube would be fine because that's the way. That's where it's supposed to be going. Yeah, you know what I would do based on what I know now about dry fasting, Tucker. I would, I would ask that I, particularly if it was a head injury, I would be happy to be dry fasted for five days. There's there's a heap of data suggesting that it's really great for concussion recovery and because you're removing all the inflammatory response out of the body. The caveat is unless you are really fat and unwell because the, the detoxification load can be way too high. But if you're yes. in good nick, like I am, I, I'd be confident and say, yeah, put me on a dry fast for five days and make my body do its thing. Right. Well, that's, that's interesting. Traumatic brain injury is one of the clear. So what happens in a traumatic brain injury? You get a, you get a whack on your head, you undergo some immediate mechanical damage, but that isn't what causes the problem. The problem is over the next 72 hours, the fats in your phospholipids, the membranes of your brain start getting released. And if you have excess omega-6 fat, then you start getting massive toxin release, right? That's pretty clearly the mechanism behind uh concussion and trauma traumatic brain injury really There's, 
Yeah, there's a great uh, Dr. Bubs has a podcast and he interviewed a guy who was a physician in the Navy SEALs. And he talked about omega-6 fats and the progression of traumatic brain injury. Um, I haven't written a lot about it, but it's pretty clearly the process that's going on is that you've got excess omega-6, right? Because that's when you're, when you undergo an injury, right? I mean, think about, you know, your body's a survival machine, right? So think about these you know, I'm in Idaho. There are lots of survivalists here in Idaho. And what do they do? They go and they have caches of food and ammunition, right? Well, that's what your body does because your body's a survival machine. And it caches these polyunsaturated fats that are necessary for immune defense in the walls of every single cell. And then when you have damage, your white blood cells, right? The soldiers can come in and grab these fats. They're right there, right where they're needed, and then convert them into the things that your body needs to fight off an infection. And the problem appears to be that you've got too much of these fats that produce toxins, right? So instead of having a, you know, a moderated reaction, you have an extreme reaction, right? It's like, instead of I don't know, to take my, I may be pushing a survivalist analogy a little too far, but say they need 22s and they're getting machine gun rounds, they're going to do a heck of a lot more damage than they ought to be doing. And they're not getting the other fats, you know, the omega-3 fats that are beneficial because they can help resolve inflammation. They're just firing away with these machine gun rounds all day and doing a lot more damage than ought to be done. So yeah, I think, you know, fasting's in, fasting's really I think going to be beneficial specifically in a context when you are going to be fed an unhealthy diet as an alternative for the fast. I think if medicine was smart enough to say, okay, this stuff is bad. This is the beneficial, these are the beneficial fats. And if we went and gave people say a evolutionarily appropriate IV feed, that might be better than it's strictly a fast, right? So in the case of this intralipid, um, they've been using this to treat people for decades, right? Since the 1960s, I think was when they started. Intralipid was invented in 1961. And a lot of people who are on these intralipid IV feeds, if they don't get ARDS, they may get liver failure, right? And what they've discovered up at the Boston Children's Hospital, um, this doctor, uh, gosh, I can't remember his name, but we just dis discussed him, Puder, P-U-D-E-R, Dr. Mark Puder runs this program at the Boston Children's Hospital where he referred to, he got into a lot of trouble for referring to intralipid as the white poison. Um, and his physician colleagues didn't like the fact that he was referring to their treatment as a poison. So he <laughs> came up, you know, <laughs> you could see why they wouldn't. Um, so he realized uh, through one of his associates um, that if you didn't use a linoleic acid containing infusion, if you use fish oil, which has like a tiny little bit of linoleic acid in it, if you used a fish oil infusion, not only would it not cause the liver damage, but it could actually cure the liver damage. It, it's allowing the body to heal the liver damage, right? By giving it the beneficial fats, the non-toxic fats that it needs to go through the entire process of injury response and then injury repair, right? Instead of just being in this permanent state of injury response, you know, wildly firing the machine gun bullets over the all over the place, it allows you to go through the healing process. And they've, you know, they have some patients who've been on this fish oil infusion for years, children, right? Who that's their primary source of calories and they're totally fine. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think a lot of it is, yeah, a lot of it is just malpractice on the part of medicine, right? That what they're doing, there's a rationale for why they're doing it. But in a lot of cases, it's been so thoroughly debunked by modern science that there's no just there's no medical justifi justification to continue doing it but it's just a practice that they have and that they 
literally, you know, have to be dragged kick, kicking and screaming into, into changing it. I mean, for this fish oil infusion, Omega Ven, because of Pooter's work, it was approved by the FDA, but only for use in children, right? In an adult, if they put you on intralipid, and I've talked to some people who've had to have this done because of, you know, um, intestinal transplantation, they put you on intralipid until it causes imminent liver failure, and then they will switch you over to Omega Ven. Now, given that we know that in children, you can avoid that process, why in God's name are they still doing this to adults, right? It makes absolutely no sense. And the animal models are pretty darn clear. Hey, look, any amount of linoleic acid in an infusion is going to cause some degree of liver damage, right? So why do they continue doing it? It's just super frustrating. Yeah, you've got one of these looks on your face. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I don't use the word retarded a lot on this podcast, but it's the word that keeps coming up. It's like humans, as brilliant as we are, just do some of the most ridiculous things, man. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know what it is, Tucker. I don't know. I really think that our diet has made us way more uh, mentally unstable over the last 50 years. I think, you know, we spent two lots of three months in the US earlier this year. And this isn't a blight on Americans at all because most of my friends are American. But I, we had some experiences with people intermittently, not too many times, and we tend to attract high quality people into our life. There were some experiences that I was just like completely and utterly flabbergasted. And I was like, how? Did that even happen? And I'm talking about like irrational, like hyper irrational response, like bipolar in, in nature. Yeah. And, and you look, even when I was there, I think I put on about 10 pounds. It was very, we were on the road. We drove from Florida to Utah, like over seven days. Like we were trying to eat well, but, but there were, you know, inevitably. Very hard taken, to do here. Right. I mean, it can be done, even as disciplined as we were, it was just like, oh, we'll just, we'll just try this or whatever. And, um, and I really noticed the difference when I came back where we are in Mexico and, and the Mexican people um, whose diet is a lot more sugar rich, but the sugar that they have is cane sugar. And they're probably less than, they, they do eat a lot more meat here um, or animal based. Um, right. Even though they've got tortillas and you know um, flour and corn, maybe corn, more corn than flour. So I don't, I don't know what that is. I suspect, based on my own experience of going insane when I've eaten refined crap up the wazoo, it's the only time that Anna and I would ever have fights, like you know arguments and irrational shit that come would come out of my mouth. It's like Jesus Christ, what's going on there? And I really, you know, I've got a history of bipolar in the family both sides. I don't know. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? You got any comments? There's a lot of evidence that diet can um, be beneficial for psychiatric conditions. Are you um, looking up Chris Palmer's book? Dr. No, Palmer? I was going to, I was about to mention that Chris Palmer has written a great book um, recently. And what he is proposing is that a lot of psychiatric diseases are caused by your mitochondria's inability to produce enough energy to support normal neurological function, right? So the motor's not working correctly. And yeah. when the motor, we know from the research into mitochondrial uh, DNA mutations, yeah, brain, brain energy. Brain energy. Great book. But I'm going back a little beyond that. He discusses that process, but never really gets into what we know can cause that process, right? And, and by the way, while you're doing that, uh, Dr. Chris Palmer is an adjunct professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, which is very unusual for these institutions to, to share this kind of information, by the way. So he's, he's a brave man. Um, and it looks like he's being interviewed on the mainstream, looking at his Twitter feed recently, which is great. He is. No, the study that I wanted to mention was done in 2004, and the title is, and I wanted to make sure I got this correct, Increasing Homicide Rates and Linoleic Acid Consumption Among Five Western Countries, 1961 to 2000. And what they found was a 20-fold increase in homicide rates, 
corresponding to linoleic acid consumption. Yikes. Oh my God, brother. <laughs> <laughs> now, Are we doomed, Tucker? Are we doomed? <laughs> I don't know that we're doomed, but I think we need to do something about this. Um, and they their conclusion was... Randomized controlled trials are needed to determine if reducing high intakes of linoleic acid by seed oils with alternative compositions can reduce the risk of violent behaviors. Now, they've gone on as a result of this work to do feeding experiments in prisons where obviously you have a high rate of aggressive behaviors. They're right now doing one in Australia. And they find that sure enough, when you reduce seed oil consumption in prison populations, you also reduce the rates of aggressive behavior. So am I super surprised by what you're describing? No. Do we have RCTs to suggest a mechanism? Yes. <laughs> well, shock me. Shock me blind. When I Well, when I interviewed Dr. Chris Palmer, I, I jokingly said to him, about throwing people in padded cells and feeding them ketogenic diets because the one third of all the patients that he treated uh, reversed, put into full remission, um, the schizophrenic, uh, the suicidal ideology, the bipolar, all went into full remission, came off all their medication. Right. One third, another one third had significant reduction in all of those things. And then the last third, there was no noticeable change. And I was like, huh, you should throw them in a padded cell and just feed them keto. And he's like, they do that, or they did that in Russia, right? The Russians, the Russians are way smarter than people realize. I mean, my wife's Russian, so I can vouch firsthand for that. But like, they're onto some of this stuff. Maybe we need oh. to lock people away with keto. One of the most amazing researchers I've come across is this guy Skulichev, who's a Russian scientist looking into uh, mitochondrial function and disease, and he's come up with a synthetic antioxidant. So, you know, so back to Chris Palmer and his hypothesis, um, there's a great YouTube discussion and maybe we'll link to it afterwards, looking at mitochondrial disease and human disease. And basically, you know, I've, I've seen this happen and it, this guy, Doug, I think it's Doug Walsh, maybe his name, but you know, we'll, we'll, I'll send you the correct link. Um, so anyway, he talks about how a single mitochondrial DNA malfunction can cause different diseases, right? And now, and the example he gives is like a car, right? So if you turn voltage down in an electrical system, what goes wrong with the electric, with the mechanical devices attached to that elect electrical system are not always obvious. I've seen this when the battery starts running out with my phone. The phone starts doing all sorts of weird things. And then when you put a new battery in, all these weird things go away. Well, your body works the same way, right? That's kind of the point that Palmer's getting to. Right? Yeah. So if, let's just say, hypothetically, you want to cause mitochondrial dysfunction. Do we know how to do that? Yes, we do. You feed people seed oils and then a high carbohydrate diet on top of that, right? Why does that happen? Because when you consume seed oils, they start being converted into toxins. My favorite toxin is this thing called 4-hydroxynonanol. I'm sure I mentioned this the last time around, so I won't go into it in any great length. The abbreviation is your HNA. favorite. <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> the reason I say that is because it's only produced from omega-6 fats. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So it's a really good marker for what is actually causing a problem, right? And it, there's also, it's super well studied. So anybody who says to me, oh, there's no evidence, I can give them literally entire journal article issues on the topic of HNE and human disease, right? I mean- you know, page after page after page of discussion of what's going on. So what does HNE do? It breaks the mitochondria and it reduces their ability to produce energy. In other words, exactly what Dr. Palmer is talking about happening. If you want to make that happen, you do it by increasing omega-6 fat intake and carbohydrate intake. Why and carbohydrate intake? Because when you are in when you are consuming carbohydrates, it turns down fat oxidation, right? And in the animal models, if you put an animal on a ketogenic diet, 
when it produces HNE, it burns it for fuel, right? It actually uses it as a fuel source. Otherwise, it goes out and it starts damaging all of the mitochondrial proteins that we use to produce energy, right? And it causes a decline in ATP production and a decline in oxygen use because you are breaking the mitochondria. You just remind, that's brilliant, by the way. Um, you just reminded me of what I wanted to include when we we're talking about dry fasting with animals. Uh, in that book that I was referencing, they talk about at least one instance of a, a dog that got hit by a car and it, it ran off into its kennel and stayed there for nine days, eight or nine days, didn't drink or eat anything, and then bounced out of there on the, on the ninth or tenth day, wagging its tail. And, and they, they observe this happening in the wild uh, with a lot of animals that, that get injured and they, they, they just dry fast. Sorry, just a bit of a yeah. cross-pollination there, but it sort of all ties into this stuff, right? Um, this is so interesting. Uh, slight topic change, Tucker. Do you know anything about grounding? I, well, I've been in part of the barefooting movement since... 2009 so yeah i hear all about grounding i don't know if there's any good basis for grounding i will say that being outside in your bare feet regardless of whether or not grounding works feels awesome <laughs> and so long as you don't step on anything like poison ivy or thorns i highly recommend it you know keep your eyes open it was really funny when i got into barefoot running somebody said well oh you're going to step on a piece of glass and sure enough, it happened. I stepped on a piece of glass <laughs> in my kitchen because I dropped a jar, right? And in trying to clean up all the broken glass in my bare feet, I stepped on a piece of glass. It went into my heel. I pulled it back out and I went outside and I went for a three mile run just to see what would happen. And it healed up like that. Fantastic. So well, yeah, keep an eye out. Don't run over nails or pricker bushes or poison ivy. Well, you know, the, the, but, reason, the, yeah, the reason, yeah, I, I don't know if grounding has a benefit, but I do know that's one of those things where just the the effect that the sensory stimulation you get when you're out there you're barefoot talking. is so significant and is going to make you feel so great that you know it's really hard to untangle those two things. The reason I wanted to ask was this is a book called Earthing. Yep, and it came with. Um, a grounding mat that we bought for the bed and and we put it on there about so three no, weeks ago gra grounding by the way for everybody is this idea that you know much like you put up a lightning rod and that grounds your house so if your house get hit, gets hit by lightning the electrons go down and into the earth right the idea is this is a beneficial thing for your body and if you get excess electron buildup from whatever that standing on something that's going to allow you to ground out those electrons is going to be beneficial to your health. Yeah. Yeah. Bingo. And and the, the reason that I might seem like obsessed with this stuff is really just in this pursuit of making this baby. Right. And, uh, and you, you, you mentioned before we started recording this um, mentioned the doctor's name just for other people that might find value in this Tucker. Pak Chung, P-A-K-C-H-U-N-G. He's a, uh, fertility doctor in new york city he's at the wild center i think um and you got pregnant while cornell medicine yeah i have well, your wife cornell did. university i have my second daughter thanks to this gentleman okay so and you reckon he's the, the best on the planet with this stuff right he was so, in, 20 years ago he was in the best practice and he was i saw i mean that was kind of my introduction to being skeptical of physicians he was the ninth fertility guy I saw, and he was the only guy who had who didn't quote BS statistics to me and said, well, we know it used to work. Why don't we see what changed? And, you know, as I said to you, you know, he thought like a plumber. And too often, physicians ought to think like plumbers, right? An honest cardiologist will tell you that all he's doing is acting like a plumber. Um, this guy actually did it. And two months later, we had a natural... Uh, pregnancy fantastic so I'll, I'll put the link to that that guy as well this this episode has just so, got so much so much value it's ridiculous the the thing with the grounding uh was 
in this pursuit of trying to make this baby. So we're just ticking off thing one by one, even crystals, Tucker, because you just never know, right? Right. The, what I've noticed since we've had the grounding mat, so we're on the third floor in Mexico and the PowerPoint, the bottom hole in a traditional American, which is the same here, is the earth uh, hole. The, right? Yeah, the third the Third, bottom uh, prong is the grounding yeah. prong, right? And and there's no there's no electricity that comes through that per se. It's just the connection to the to the ground, right? And you can test it right. with these certain things. But here's what I've noticed. Here's what I've noticed. I would occasionally get tingling in my arm, arms or legs if I overdrank carbonated water. Shock me. I don't know if there's any science behind that, right? I'll get you to answer that in a minute. And I, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think maybe it's a buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood. I don't know. All right. Cause I've been wearing my sophisticated Garmin Epix, which, which measures my, the, the uh, oxygen saturation, my respiratory rate, my resting heart rate, which is very low, by the way, it's about 41 beats a minute. Um, and the grounding mat, I've been waking up with almost without exception, a pronounced powerful erection. And the numbing in my arms and stuff has almost completely dissipated. Isn't that interesting? Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> like who doesn't want that, right? Yeah, there you go. And and so because the so you it, sleep on this, so it goes underneath the fitted bottom sheet. Okay. And the the natural micro amounts of moisture that the body wicks or creates when you're sleeping, connects you and grounds you to that mat. So you can sleep directly on it, but as long as you've got a natural fiber, like cotton or, you know, probably silk or something, I suppose. Right. You want, we want to avoid, poly who sleeps on polyester sheets anyway, but um, yeah. So, and that's been the thing. So we're effectively getting eight, nine hours every, every extra day of being connected to the earth, which is, could only be a good thing, right? Yeah, I've looked into that a little bit. I've never been able to find good science. I mean, but I don't think on the other hand, it's going to cause you any harm. And if it makes you feel better, I mean, you know, it's interesting. There's a lot, you know, I used to think ionizing radiation. They used to talk about how radiation, you know, when they would talk about cell phones and whether or not cell phone radiation could be harmful to you, they scientists would say no no if it's not ionizing radiation then it's not a problem okay so what's ionizing radiation it's it's like x-rays or gamma rays right it's the stuff that's actually going to knock a electron off of a uh, molecule in your body and change how it functions and if that happens to dna it causes dna mutations right so they said, if it's not ionizing radiation, it's not something to be concerned about. And then I start doing this, you know, seed oil research and turns out that it doesn't have to be ionizing radiation. It can be ultraviolet radiation. It can be blue light is sufficient to cause molecules like polyunsaturated fats to break down into toxins that can cause DNA damage, right? And we know this is happens because age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in the industrial world. And it's caused at least in part by blue light causing the polyunsaturated fats in your eyes to break down into toxins, which, you know, causes your retina to melt, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so when I was a kid Jesus. growing up and I heard, oh, if it's not ionizing radiation, you don't have to worry about it. Well, now we know that that's not correct. Yeah. Um, and yeah, could cell phone radiation be having the same effect on your body it's possible so you know well there's there's 10 pages of references on this book i haven't gone through and bothered to check any of them it's kind of like an intuitive thing right like i'll i'll continue to utilize it until such time as i've determined that it's that's ineffective but most of the intuitive responses that i've had about everything in the last five or six years especially since i've been eating mainly animal based have been proven or been vindicated in many ways, not perfectly, yeah. but in many ways, I'm like, ah, oh, that was, you know, my hunch was right. So I'm relying more on my own, my own body, my own spiritual connection, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's fascinating. Intuition. 
intuition Almost, yeah 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 well, and you know it gets it gets back to you know we're not evolved to be in concrete and metal buildings with lots of electromagnetic rays going through right? steering it webcams basically what you're doing is replicating sleeping on the ground every night which is what we would have been doing for you know billions of years right it's what every single <laughs> yeah. animal on the planet does is sleep on the ground every night they don't or maybe up in a tree i mean they don't climb into a steel structure to spend the, night. the tree's connected to the earth as long as it's connected to the earth that's that's the right. main thing right uh Tucker, where let's go over where people can access all of your stuff because you've got a you got a podcast you're still doing the show with dave gorski yeah so um pro- I'm most active on Twitter. Uh, my handle's at Tucker Goodrich. I have a link to my blog there. It's uh, the most horrible URL on earth. I've been told uh, yelling-stop.blogspot.com. Um, one, of the, one of the things on my to-do list is to get something better than that. But I've got 1,500 posts in there on a variety of different topics, um, everything from barefoot running to seed oils. Um, I do a weekly radio show uh, with David Gornoski, um, and we cover health topics, you know, generally around seed oils and chronic disease, but we do get into some other stuff. Um, and you can find that if you Google the neighbor's choice, or I post links to these things on my blog. Um, I've got- We'll this, put it in the show notes, yeah. Yeah, I've got this podcast that we've been doing, and I've got a couple of back episodes that I need to get out. Um, uh, with my partner, Brian Curley, who's a physician. Um, and I've got some, you know, Tom Brenner, that was a really great interview. Uh, my personal physician here in Idaho, who uses seed oils as part of his practice and has improved his own personal health by cutting seed oils out of his diet. Um, that was a really interesting discussion. So I'm trying to help people help a get this information out and also particularly, get in touch with, you know, make medical professionals realize that this is a solid body of science and medicine behind this, right? So that yeah. when they hear some clown say, well, hexane's not an issue, they can say, yeah, but you're missing the point. Amen, brother. Tucker, do you have any concluding thoughts for our audience today? I've just, you know, um, the stories I keep hearing, uh, Dr. Durham, my physician here in Boise, tells the story of a patient he had who was 70 pounds overweight and like on a whole bunch of different drugs. And he told him to fix his diet. And the guy came in six months later at his high school body weight, carrying two bags full of prescriptions. And he dropped them on the table and said, I'm not taking any of these anymore. I feel great. The guy was on oxygen and got off his oxygen. And I asked Dr. Durham, I was like, is there anything that you learned in medical school that can get somebody off oxygen? And his answer was no. But by fixing your diet, you can, you can do it. You can, it's amazing the stories I've heard from people who are able to fix their health in various ways by fixing their diet and often unfortunately going against the dietary recommendations that physicians offer us right so you really have to be open-minded you have to be scientific about it you have to ex- do your experimentation but the results that i've seen and that i've heard medical professionals experience it it's pretty phenomenal it can be pretty phenomenal it's not magic right it's not you know if, if you've already got a cancer that's associated with seed oil consumption, the time to stop seed oils isn't after you've got the cancer, right? It's when you're healthy and when your body is in a position to repair itself and start operating the way it was meant to. Well, there's a great quote that says the, the best time to plant an oak tree is 30 years ago. The second best time to plant an oak tree is right now. Tucker yeah. Goodrich. Thank you for your service. We appreciate you tremendously and the millions of hours that you'll eventually put into getting the word out oh, to the world. And I, one other thing, I've been working with a company called Zero Acre Farms. Um, they are trying, they are producing, 
uh, cultured oil, which is a low linoleic acid oil. And as part of my work with them, we're trying, we're producing a lot of very in-depth um, summaries of the research. We've got one on heart disease that I think is like 35 pages when you print it out. We have one on cancer that's coming out. We have one on insulin resistance. So, and it's all the peer peer reviewed research. Um, so those, that's uh, zeroacre.com. And if you go to your their blog, you'll see their white papers and a lot of great blog posts on, you know, in-depth reviews of the research uh, more than I can do in my blog sometimes. So they've they've been they've been doing a lot of great research and or a lot of great work in trying to a produce a product that can help people get seed oils out of their diet and also in making people understand why that's a good thing to do. And while you're on this, while you while you're on your browser, people check out Dr. Chris Kenobi and his work K N O B B E as well. He's got a new book which will be coming out in 2023 very very soon depending on when this gets released unless you've got any objection to that tucker no no he's chris is a great guy yeah ladies and gentlemen tucker goodrich it's been a pleasure thanks for having me back <laughs>